Okay, so um, I'm going to just very briefly go over some expression units that you may have heard and uh, might sound weird. <laughs> um, so you've, I'm sure you've heard uh, counts. Um, so counts is basically the number of fragments that, uh, that come from some particular target sequence. Um, it's literally the count that is compatible with this particular target sequence. Um, and when I say target sequence, I'm talking about like a transcript, but we can be more general and talk about like a genome, or, um, for example. Um, so FPKM is sort of this, uh, is I think one of the first, if not the first unit that appeared beyond the counts in RNA-seq um, from this uh, Ali Mortazavi paper in like 2009. Um, it's the fragments per kilo base of exon per million reads mapped. Um, a lot of people are shying away from this for a number of different reasons, so I'm not really going to go over it too much, but basically it's proportional to the, um, the reads per base normalized by the total reads that you saw in the experiment. Does that make sense? So reads per base normalized by the to total number of reads. And this makes it so that you can basically compare transcripts within um, a, uh, a sample. Um, and most of the reason that people are, are shying away from this is that uh, you can't compare without doing a norm another normalization, you can't compare them across samples because they depend, this N here depends on the sequencing depth, is, is dependent per the on the sample, and we'll talk about why that's a bad idea when we get to the differential expression section. Um, and then there's transcripts per million. So this is basically, it gives you, um, I'm missing a factor here actually by a million, but uh, this gives you a proportion of how, how much uh, this, uh, how much you sequenced of this transcript relative to all the other things that you sequenced in the sample. So it's a reads per base normalized by all of the reads per base in the sample. And then this is supposed to be multiplied by a million, um, but it literally is a proportion of like how much of this transcript I saw relative to everything else. Okay. Okay, so uh, just a comment about the additivity of units. Um, so if you want to take some aggregate of things, uh, you know, counts can't be, uh, be summed across uh, many different features. And the reason because of that is this uh, length bias, right? So if these things, if, if two transcripts are of different length, then the relative rate of them being sequenced is different um, just due to the length, and then you can't uh, sum them for that reason. Um, so FPKM and TP TPM uh, account for length, so they can be summed. So if you, in principle, if you wanted the TPM of some gene, you can take the sum of all the compatible isoforms and you get the, the uh, expression of that, uh, that gene. Um, so this is sort of a side note. Um, there's, so you know that there's sort of like two schools of thought uh, when it comes to RNA-seq analysis. There's like the transcript abundance estimation people, which I fall into, and then there's also these, uh, the, the raw counts people that take uh, the raw counts. And this is sort of a note uh, talking about that a little bit, uh, that RNA-seq is actually measuring transcripts. So the notion of counting from genes is a bit, uh, it's a bit murky, right? Uh, it's not really well posed, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. Okay, so gene counting. So you may have heard uh, gene counts or raw reads or raw counts, I mean. Um, and typically what, what uh, people do in this situation is, let's say you have two isoforms at a particular locus, then you can take uh, what's called the exon union model. You can also take the exon intersection model, but a lot of people don't do this, and it's not the default in most of the programs um, because of the fact that if you were to take the intersection across some uh, lo loci, uh, there's basically like nothing left, so you can't actually quantify against a lot of loci. Uh, this is very true in human. Okay, so you have some set of reads and then you have some, uh, some annotation with different isoforms and then you take the exon union and then the goal is to sort of get some expression estimate of the gene. Okay, so then you, you simply uh, count the number of fragments that are compatible with the, or the number of reads in this case that are compatible with this exon union uh, thing that you have. Okay, so if you actually knew the correct sort of mapping, right, the, that the red transcripts came from isoform A and, the, uh, sorry, the red reads came from isoform A and the blue reads came from isoform B, you might get some expression estimate that's uh, proportional to 1 over 60, okay? Uh, the truth is we don't actually know this, so the best you can do with uh, exon union is to sort of count everything that, that, that uh, maps across this locus. 
And then you end up getting something like this. Uh, so the FPKM of the union is now 1 over 75, or proportional to 1 over 75. Now, uh, you can actually prove that uh, if you take the union, you will always have um, an underestimate of the expression. So, um, yeah, the, the best that you can do um, is that in some situations you have uniquely mapping reads, or what we think is the best you can do, or sort of the state of the art right now, is it's sort of trying to estimate the abundances of uh, the transcripts from the reads, right? And we'll talk about how to do that soon. Um, you have red reads, you have blue reads that, that give you unique information about that, and then you have all of these uh, purple reads that are ambiguous. And then you have to basically assign these reads in some, uh, using some probabilistic method to, uh, to infer the abundances of isoform A and B. Okay, so how, uh, what sort of issues arise from using this exon union uh, model? Um, so this is from the CUFDIF2 paper. Uh, you can take a look at it, and there's a lot of little examples. I'm not going to go into it too much detail. But basically there, um, there's sort of some cooked up examples that show that if, uh, if you have isoforms of different lengths, which is pretty much always the case, um, over some locus, and you're interested in the gene level expression, that if you take the exon union under different situations, depending on how those reads are distributed across the transcripts, that they can actually be misleading in pretty much every way possible. In some situations, they can give you um, like upregulated uh, measurements, so a positive log full change. In some situations, they could give you a, a down, uh, a, lot, a negative log full change, down regulation, and sometimes they'll just, uh, they won't say anything. Um, and this is due to the fact that you're, you're counting things that are of different lengths, and basically, I mean, it boils down to taking the sum of fractions versus the fraction of sums. Um, and we can talk about that uh, offline. Um, it boils down, or it comes from this thing, basically, right, that we took uh, this. And this is inherently doing that. It's taking the sum of the fractions. Uh, versus the fraction, sorry, the sum of the fractions versus the uh, fraction of the sums. Okay. Oh. All right. Um, so how wrong is gene counting? This is something that uh, people are still arguing about right now. Um, this is some. This is also from the CUFDIF2 paper. Uh, they basically took a, a bunch of experiments uh, using um, uh, this Hox uh, one. Uh, Hox1A knockdown with, um, with some scrambled uh, knockdowns um, as a control, and then uh, they showed that uh, CUFDIF2 is actually uh, more concordant with uh, microarrays. So you could make of that what you will, but uh, I mean, there, there hasn't been really, it's, it's really hard to, to make a good benchmark of like how wrong this, this sort of estimate is. Um, I think that's one reason that we really don't, um, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, but uh, this is this is sort of the cuff diff to attempt where they took a bunch of microarrays and tried to actually see how much they differ, uh, you know, using gene counting versus microarrays. Okay, so now we're actually getting to the transcript abundance estimation. So this is sort of the meat of the problem here, um, and I'll explain the situation. Uh, there's basically the sort of simplified model where you know all of the mappings, and that's what I'm going to explain now. Um, okay, so we have some target sequences which are transcripts. And then we see some reads from them, right? So each one of these little uh, green boxes is a read. And our observations might be um, you know, some number of reads from every single transcript, right? Um, if you knew the truth, you could take the simple likelihood of this model. It's a multinomial model where um, alpha are the rates and uh, u are the counts, right? So it simplifies to this, this model if you've taken like a sort of a, maybe like an intro to uh, statistics class, uh, like actually meant for statisticians, um, you might see this model a lot. Um, and you can sort of show with a little bit of math and some Lagrange multipliers that, um, that the, the maximum likelihood estimate is simply the counts of whatever, like blue, over everything else, right? So this is just going to give you an estimate of the relative rates because you don't know the rates here. And you can simply do that taking the number of reads that you saw over all of the number of reads uh, here. OK. Um, but the truth is that we don't know what the correct mappings are. And uh, this, the correct mapping is, is latent. Um, 
Right? So you can actually get mappings that are compatible with all these different transcripts. Right? So we can have the uh, blue and green uh, compatibility, which gives us this sort of like teal color. You have red and uh, blue, which gives us this purple. And you can imagine pretty much any combination of things just because reads are ambiguous, because you know, one read, again, um, can, can basically identify uh, several different fragments depending on where they map. Right. OK, and then the, the truth is our data is now no longer just simply red, green, and blue. We have all these different colors. And what, what we want to infer now is the relative rates of just red, green, and blue, right? Uh, a teal here really isn't important. What is the mixture of these things? We, what we really care is like how much um, of each transcript there was in this, uh, in this particular sample. OK, so the, the basic algorithm is as follows. We have some unobserved variable, uh, which is expression, which we want to uh, estimate. So the typical way, and there's a lot of statistical literature on this, is using the expectation, expectation maximization algorithm, or the EM algorithm. Um, this isn't just something that we made up uh, like a few years ago in RNA seq it, it has some well-founded uh, statistics for many years. And the basic idea is that uh, you have two different steps, the expectation step and the maximization step. And in the expectation step, you have some abundances. And uh, you, know, you might set them up as, with some prior. And you estimate the probability of each read mapping uh, to each transcript. Okay? So then you, you're basically proportionally assigning each read relative to the rates that you had, your prior rates. And then you maximize, do some maximization steps. So you, you actually update the abundances now by redistributing the, rate, the reads um, depending on this uh, proportion that, that you have um, for each read. Okay, and then you go to step one until convergence. So what does that look like? Um, so here we have some prior in the top left-hand corner. And in the E step, we're proportionally assigning all of these reads. And um, I believe that each one of these transcripts yeah, they're all of the, each, each one of the transcripts are the same length. So um, in this situation, it's a, a bit simpler. Like the, the actual, in the actual algorithm, you have to keep track of a bunch of other things. But in this case, it's a bit simplified because all the lengths are equal. But anyway, so we uh, proportionally assign A. A is compatible with red, green, and blue. Then we have uh, fragment uh, B that is compatible with uh, green and blue. And then, for example, uh, fragment uh, D is compatible only with uh, with red, so it's a, it's a unique mapping, and that's not proportionally assigned. So in the M step, you you uh, re-estimate your you take this maximum likelihood estimate, uh, assuming that these are the mappings, and you iterate over this, right? So you keep doing this over and over and over again, and you can actually prove that your likelihood will uh, be uh, non-decreasing. So that at every step, you're at least as good as the last step, and possibly better. And under some circumstances, you'll you're guaranteed to get like a local maximum. Um, and then even in un under some models, you can even get a global maximum. Um, but anyway, so you could read more about, uh, about this in, um, in this uh, preprint on the archive that Lior has. It's sort of like a review of this, uh, of these sort of models. That's where this uh, figures from. But basically, all the, all of the transcript quantification methods boil down to doing some sort of inference algorithm like this. And then what do you get out of? Uh, out of one of these tools, like Callisto or Sailfish or Cufflinks, uh, you end up getting basically an abundance estimate for every single isoform. Uh, it's often a plain text table. You know, you have some transcripts, and then you have a bunch of columns: um, TPM, estimated counts, maybe the FPKM, uh, the length and the effective length, which we didn't talk about, but uh, it's uh, related to how long the fragments are in the, the experiment. Um, and there's a few things to note, and I think many of you have touched on this already, that uh, the results are highly dependent on the particular transcript, uh, sorry, the particular transcriptome, uh, the mapping step, or what sort of parameters you set, and what is considered to be uh, compatible. So you can imagine, like your question earlier was, uh, you know, what if there's like a, a missing annotation and then you have like partial mapping or even like a complete mapping to another um, isoform. So really, you take these by, on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's, I don't think that there's any sort of blanket statement that you can make about uh, how good or how poor you'll be doing. Uh, I think in general, in, in like human, if you assume that we're not missing that much of the annotation, which I think is probably true, 
you're not really doing that poorly. Um, you're, you're doing quite well. Um, so there's been uh, a few papers that have tried to sort of answer this question. And it sort of starts breaking down, I want to say, when you're missing probably like 15 to 20 percent of the transcriptome. Um, it, it, and it also kind of depends on which ones you're missing and how you drop things out, right? Because the truth is that the things that you're probably missing are the things that are not highly expressed. Um, and in that situation, you can't really measure them well anyway in RNA-seq, so they're probably not affecting you that much. Um, I, I don't think the problem is that bad, to be honest. But, uh, but yeah, we could chat about that again after the fact. OK, so differential expression analysis. Does anyone have any questions on, on the, this abundance estimation uh, section before I go to the next section?